poets are sort of you know, are like the Rodney Dangerfield of you know, the arts, like I don't get no respect. Like the stock market, which was my previous uh, work uh, career, you can never know all that there is to know about wine. I was at uh, Time Warner for 20 years, and then, you know, one day they said, you know, give us your ID, your computer's turned off, and you have to leave the building. Welcome to Study With The Best, the magazine show about cutie. I'm Dwayne. Brooklyn College professor and writer Josh Megan finds inspiration for poetry everywhere, even at his local donut shop. And if you think meter is something that you just feed quarters to, I would assume that you'd be guessing wrong. Just watch the piece. Most people in the world do, I think, tend to wonder about you if you announce to them that you're a poet. Part of it is that all you have to do uh, to, to say that is have a pen. Poets are sort of, you know, are like the Rodney Dangerfield of you know, the arts, like, I don't get no respect. If you look at, at the way poems are presented on YouTube, you'll see that people often don't think that poetry is enough. You'll have poems by Shakespeare with some, some Kenny G in the background. I don't want to sound like a, like a snob, but if I hear a poem with music, I start to get angry because the whole point is that the words are supposed to be in the foreground. My name is Joshua Megan and I am a writer. I use meter and line in my poems. Most poetry that's ever been written has had a beat. I'm the pentameter is the most popular meter in English. It's very natural. People think that it's not natural. It's constantly denigrated as artificial, overly artificial, but I hear it all day long. I hear it on the subway. I hear it, I see it in signs. Area under video surveillance. Okay, that's the line of I'm the pentameter. I heard a guy in Dunkin' Donuts say, I come, I do my work, I leave, that's it. That's a line of my contender. It's very natural to English. In about 2008, I lived in Gowanus, Brooklyn, and I would always have right in front of me a smokestack. And every day I saw the, the, um, you know, the smoke, and I would sort of think about what the smoke looked like. The town had a smokestack. It had a church spire. The church was prettier, but the smokestack was higher. It was a lone ruined column, a single snuffed taper, a field gun fired at heaven, a tube making vapor. The smoke thinned the attention. Its aspect kept transforming. It could look like a cloud or like mosquitoes swarming. In my own poetry, I try to stay away from just being kooky or just, or just having, you know, kind of far out, you know, dreamy ideas. My poems are fairly plain spoken. They're not usually that difficult. I use rhyme a lot. It can make a poem musical in a way that might attract somebody who doesn't like poetry. People love Dr. Seuss, you know. I mean, I'm not writing poems that are exactly like Dr. Seuss poems, but uh, most people I know who are not poets, who haven't been through an MFA program, uh, who, are, who have not studied the history of 20, 20th century poetry criticism, 
prefer Dr. Seuss. Rabbit's foot. Grandfather Rabbit and Grandfather Hare, forgive us your forgetful progeny who unleash dogs to shake you in their jaws, then sell your hacked off hands as souvenirs. Forgive us. Our hearts, too, are very little, and race with blood as tenuous as our fate. We also tremble helplessly, or flee. But with this relic of your ancient luck, so may we also often procreate and burrow always toward the mystery below, as our grandfather Rabbit does. And may our naked children, as yours do, Grandfather Hare, drop always open-eyed onto the sunlit meadow of despair. I really want my poems to be read. I would like to reach, you know, as wide an audience as possible without making my poems like TV. I had a couple of kids write to me, actually, who, who read a couple of my poems in high school classes and said that they liked them because they actually could understand what the hell I was talking about. Hunter College Times Square Art Gallery recently celebrated the 100th anniversary of the birth of New York avant-garde artist, composer John Cage, with the exhibition Notations, The Cage Effect Today. John Cage, the most important American artist of the second half of the 20th century. And I say, well, Andy Warhol would not exist without John Cage. On view were works by contemporary artists whose art was influenced by Cage. This is New York artist Linda Stillman at her installation, Daily Paintings of the Sky 2007. A project I started in 2005 where I paint the sky every day from a, one pane of my window. And I think it's related to the work of John Cage in its interest in time and the use of the everyday. He's mostly known as a composer, but he's had a huge influence on visual artists, and that's what this show celebrates. The Hunter College Times Square Gallery is located at 450 West 41st Street. For current schedule, go to www.hunter.cuny.edu slash art slash galleries. smelling of the wine, but when you taste your wine, it's always about the taste and not the swallow. We really want to give it a vigorous swirl and really stick your nose in this glass. You want to take a big gulp. You want air to come into your mouth. You're really letting it caress all of your mouth. You're letting it interact with the tongue and the teeth and all of that kind of good stuff. And again, are we getting fruit notes? Are we getting spice notes? Um, and if we are getting fruit, is it more uh, tree fruits, like an apple or pear, or is it more kind of berry fruits, like a cherry? I was introduced to CUNY really early on. My dad is a graduate of uh, the City College of New York. My grandmother lives right around the corner from the campus. Uh, so it really has been a, a fabric of my family forever. Um, but I was introduced to the idea of having this wine class uh, because a few of our customers, our professionals um, at City College or at, at CUNY, um, I had done a radio broadcast uh, at WHCR, which is a part of one of CUNY's uh, radio stations, and it was such a great experience. People were calling in, asking questions, and it really, really was a brainchild out of that experience and knowing uh, the director of the Adult Continuing Ed program. And the theme of tonight's class is food and wine pairing, a match made in heaven, which is the title. And so each session will have a different theme and they'll borrow uh, from one session to another, and we purposefully created it that way so one person can take the first session, the third session, all four sessions, so they don't have to feel married to uh, taking all four classes. In the instance of introducing spicier foods, you really always want to have a contrast. So what offsets a lot of that heat and the burn sometimes that comes with spicy 
foods. It's an off-dry, fresh, juicy wine. And vegetables are always gonna be the prickly part about pairing. I was a trader uh, on Wall Street for seven years, and a big component of that sales and trading environment is entertaining, taking clients out. And then at some point in my Wall Street career, uh, my interest shifted from the stocks, the market, um, and really more about wine. We've always wanted to showcase small producers, organic producers, uh, producers that really, when you go back to their vineyards, they're farmers and they really care about the land uh, from where their grapes come. Seems like it's a heavier. I'm getting white floral, I'm getting like some little pencil shavings on this, I'm getting celery. So I love saying that I am, I know it's not quite true, but a professor, um, although you know these are the adult continuing ed programs, it's such a great connection to the community and really talking about something that I love. Uh, and it's a great learning experience for me as well because like the stock market, which was my previous uh, work uh, career, you can never know all that there is to know about wine. Similar to working on Wall Street, you can never know all that there is to know about Wall Street. So for me to have this ability uh, once a week to connect with students who want to learn and ask questions and taste different wines, that's the fun part of the job because I'm learning different things as I talk about and introduce them to different wines. And the students are always engaged, they're asking lots of questions, they're certainly voicing their opinions about what they like or don't like, and that's always, that's, that's the good part about teaching class. Yay! Every year, thousands of young adults find themselves on the wrong side of the law, and many end up in prison. The Prisoner Reentry Institute, an innovative program at CUNY's John Jay College of Criminal Justice, is working with communities throughout the city to address and ultimately eliminate recidivism. What motivated me was not wanting to go back to jail, like handcuffs being on me, like nobody, nobody want to go through that. And that's what motivates me every day to come here. Not want to be in the street, don't want to hear my parole, some mouth, so stays in the, I stay in the program, motivated every day, come early on time, get, get the work done, do whatever I have to do. At the Prison Reentry Institute, our mission is to spur innovation um, and to advance practice in the field of reentry, and we do this by looking to um, what, what the research says about what works in reentry. According to the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services, of the 26,586 offenders released from prison in 2007, 26.3% were returned to prison for a violation, compared with 27.5% of the offenders released in 2006. Programs like this one hope to ensure that these rates keep dropping. One of the ways to do this is to get out into the communities and identify the people at risk. The difference is, is basically coming home and wanting to do something new. You know, not want to come home and be back on the street corner or robbing people again, things like that. So this program is something new. Like it's just, it's just best for you. In New York City, the Bronx has the highest recidivism rate of the five boroughs. The Prisoner Reentry Institute has partnered with the New York City Justice Corps, who, along with the Phipps Community Development Corporation, work to accomplish this goal. Here in the Bronx, we serve uh, 125 young adults ages 18 to 24 per year, and they all have to reside within the South Bronx. And that's really the heart of the, of the program. I did a little bit of everything, cleaning, filing papers, you name it, anything that was basically needed help doing. We're located in the heart of Morrisania. Um, we're three blocks away from, you know, a whole bunch of different public housing complexes that a lot of our core members come from, and so they feel ownership that, that this is their space, this is a safe space. Um, we partnered with over 30 community organizations um, to help make their spaces better. 
projects that range from renovating a daycare center or senior center to painting murals um, outside of schools to doing community gardens um, throughout the Bronx. And so all of these projects are happening in the same place where they are from. My internship was on, um, if I remember, 138 in Lincoln. It was in the senior citizen home. I actually, yeah, I had a good time there. Everything was great. I actually, they came to my graduation when I graduated. So I think it's this, this um, the neighborhood embracing the change and embracing the way that, that our young core members can, can do something positive in their lives. The community has fully embraced this program. Local churches, community centers, and organizations have all come together with the New York City Justice Corps to offer internships and training to committed Corps members. The internships and training not only prepare Corps members for jobs they may receive in the future, it also helps them develop a sense of pride in themselves and their communities. Anybody coming home from jail should want to be in a program like this. Um, it's a way to stay off the street, you know, making money, and you get an experience, work experience. Like, it's not like, like they just putting you out there. Like, you getting, you getting hands on, training, everything. It's not an easy process, and not everyone makes it into the program. But for those who do, it's a rewarding experience and a positive life lesson. I was at uh, Time Warner for 20 years, and then, you know, one day they said, you, you know, give us your ID, your computer's turned off, and you have to leave the building. And I felt, wait, you know, wait, I'm Jim, remember? I was a journalist, and uh, circumstances led me to become a corporate communications guy, a director of corporate communications at Time Warner, uh, where I toiled for eight years uh, trying to keep employees happy, trying to keep employees believing that they were part of a larger we. We are all part of a team. We are all employees of Time Warner. And I found out that turned out not really to be true. One day, the CEO ordered the layoff of 500 people, including myself. And the next day, he, the CEO told the press that, quote, we have eliminated the bloat at corporate headquarters. So, you know, who's we, who's the bloat? That really tells you all you know, need to know about the idea that we're all, we're all we here in this corporation. I say I worked there for 20 years. They say I worked there for 18 years because there were two years where I was a contract worker. And if they acknowledge those two years as being an employee, then I would have retiree medical benefits. Uh, as, as, as it is, I didn't. So I felt like they said to me, screw you. Oh, and by the way, screw your family too. You know, really, what is a corporation? What is a company? A company was a, a large group of like-minded individuals banding together for a common end. Uh, and back in the day, you were a company man. Uh, you went to work for Kodak or Exxon or Procter & Gamble and you expected to stay there for your whole life. And the company would take care of you with health care, with a pension. Uh, you were loyal to the company and you could expect the company to be loyal to you in return. See, the company now is just a, it's a hollow shell. It's an organization chart. Now, it wasn't special about my company. This happens across the board now. It's the new normal. When people are laid off, they are escorted from the building as though they are presumed criminals. And this is crazy. Hello. Hello, Hello everybody. It took me a while to realize that I hadn't been downsized. The company had been downsized. It was smaller. I was the same size as before. In fact, for me being laid off, although it made me angry, it was an opportunity to now find something that's meaningful for me. 
I'm James Kunin, and I'm a teacher of English as a second language here at LaGuardia Community College. Anyone remember the name of the river? Washington crossing the... Delaware. Yeah, the Delaware River is between New Jersey and, and uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Junior, yes. I have uh, students who were nurses in South America and who are cleaning houses here in Queens uh, because their degrees and their skills are not translatable until they master this language, which is not easy to do if you, if you arrive as an adult. Carolina, who's a waitress in a diner, was a, uh, had a master's in engineering in Colombia. I now had the opportunity to stand up and stretch and grow and to be fully myself and find a job where, like teaching English at LaGuardia, I don't have to leave part of myself at the door. How many people can say that when you go into work in the morning, that you can take all of you into your job? You don't leave any of you outside at the door. That's a job that lets you feel like you are fully you, and that's a wonderful feeling. They inspire me because they, they have no complaints, they're upbeat, they're uh, courageous, resilient, and tremendously generous to one another. Nothing could be more opposite from the corporate setting. We are all part of a genuine we. There's love for one another, and that's not the uh, predominant feeling at a corporation. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for checking us out. Want to see more? Find a computer. Go to cuny.edu. Better yet, like us on Facebook. Better yet, tweet us at, at CUNY TV. Do what you want. <laughs> Keep watching. Take it easy. Bye. Here. Nothing has changed. They have a welcome sign, a hill with cows and a white house on top a mall and grocery store where people shop, a diner where some people go to dine. It is the same no matter where you go. In downtown, you will find no big surprises. Each fall, the dew point falls until it rises. White snow, green buds, green lawn, red leaves, white snow. This is all right. This is their hope. And yet, the what you see is never what you get. It does feel somehow changed from what it was. Is it the people, houses, fields, the weather? Is it the streets? Is it these things together? Nothing here ever changes till it does.